With fewer performance cars featuring manual transmissions, high riding SUVs taking the place of nimble hatches and electric motors replacing petrol powertrains, the last few years have been a rough ride for hot hatch fanatics. But no one told the status quo to these two Japanese holdouts. We've got arguably two of the most dedicated and most serious hot hatches in our grips and we're going to test them on road and on the track. Which one will reign supreme? Place your bets and let's go and find out. The Toyota GR Corolla and Honda Civic Type R were both introduced to Australia in 2023 and are already winning fans in their respective camps. But this is the first time we've paired the two together to see which one is better. One wears an iconic badge with over 30 years of heritage and the other represents a fresh take on what a hot hatch should be. For the latter, the Toyota GR Corolla brings a turbocharged three-cylinder engine and equips an all-wheel drivetrain, while the respected Honda Civic Type R stays true to its roots with a front drive layout. The Toyota is the less expensive of the two, but sadly it's extremely difficult to get a hold of considering Toyota is only bringing in 700 cars in the first year. There are marginally more Type R's coming into the country, but it's still a tricky prospect to get your hands on one. Against a $64,190 list price before on-road costs, you'll pay roughly $70,000 drive away for a GR Corolla GTS if you're in Melbourne like us. For that spend, you're getting a turbocharged 1.6 litre engine from the GR Yaris hot hatch, but it's been tuned to extract more power. 221 kilowatts and 370 newton meters. These outputs are routed through an all-wheel drive system. That GR4 all-wheel drive system is electronically adjustable between three separate torque splits, there are limited slip differentials on both axles, and a six-speed manual transmission is the only option. Other kit to get excited about includes a set of 18-inch cast alloy wheels wrapped in Yokohama Advan Apex tires, aluminium pedals, an eight-speaker JBL sound system, head-up display, leather shift knob, handbrake and steering wheel, and adaptive cruise control. Oh, and heated seats too. On the outside, this white car isn't doing a whole lot to shake the Corolla's boring white goods reputation, but there is a whole lot going on in terms of exterior bodywork. Now up front, you've got a low and wide front air apron to let in all that air, bonnet vents to let it all out again, 18 inch LO wheels, further back you've got these GR4 side skirts, and it all ends in this subtle rear spoiler at the back. The car also gets three exhaust pipes. Now let's go check out the Civic Type R. The sixth generation Honda Civic Type R tones down the outlandish looks of its predecessor, but still looks suitably pumped in all the right places. It's priced from $72,600 drive away nationwide, and like the GR Corolla, only comes in six speed manual specification. The powertrain has been largely pinched from its predecessor, but now outputs 235 kilowatts and 420 newton meters through the front wheels. It gets a limited slip differential over the front axle, a series of driving modes, including the provision to create your own, a switchable active exhaust, 19-inch alloy wheels wrapped in Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tyres, and a set of obnoxious red seats inside the cabin, though we'll get to those shortly. Though it's not quite as out there as a Civic Type R from before, this Rally Red example still has a lot going for it in terms of looks. Up front, you've got a low and wide front apron, bonnet vents, these spoke alloy wheels which have red Brembo brake calipers. Down the side, you've got side splitter, and it all ends in this big black wing at the back. You've also got three exhaust pipes which sit underneath an accentuated rear splitter. Of these two hot hatches, the Corolla looks far more adjacent to the run-of-the-mill passenger car it's based on, but there are still intentional GR touches inside the cabin. You've got this nice small diameter leather lined steering wheel, uh, gear selector and handbrake as well. Now these seats that I'm sat in are covered in a nice ultra suede fabric, but they are pinned from the Corolla ZR, so they might look a little bit familiar as well. Other bits to get excited about in this car are the 12.3 inch digital instrument cluster, which is infinitely adjustable, and that's exactly what you want in a dedicated performance car. You've also got an eight inch display handling the infotainment, a wireless phone charger, heated seats, and then down by my feet, you've also got a set of aluminum pedals, which have rubberized grips, which makes it perfect for downshifting. Ergonomics wise, I'm sat in these seats right now, and it is very comfortable, but it doesn't have that much support around the sides and thighs. And I also wish this steering wheel would go a little bit higher as well. I am tall, I'm 194 centimeters, so there is that. Now around the center console, you don't have a center console bin, which is a massive omission in this car. And one thing that I love about that Civic Type R over there. Now there are slots and dual cup holders, but overall there's not that much in the way of storage, which is a bit of a shame. Infotainment is decidedly small by today's standards, but it includes the new Toyota layout. 
It's super simple to navigate and use, but I've been using Apple CarPlay throughout my week with the car, which has functioned without any issues whatsoever. The digital cluster is very customizable with gauges for G meters, boost pressure, fuel data, gear position, and the all wheel drive system. It all looks excellent. So here we are in the back seat, and once I'm back here, I've actually got a decent amount of room given I'm quite tall. There's decent headroom, knee room could be a little bit more, but you've got dual cup holders down here, map pockets as always, and bottle holders in the doors. Things not in great supply are amenities. You've got a single 12 volt port and a USB slot, but they have to be shared with the front row. But the thing the Corolla does have going for it is it has seating for five, whereas a Civic Type R only seats four people. Much like the regular Corolla, the GR's boot is tiny. There is only 213 litres worth of stuff that you'll fit in the back here, and there's only a tyre repair kit in case of emergencies. On the other hand, the Civic Type R feels really special inside the cabin, and very red. Now it's obvious that Honda has made much more of a performance focus inside this cabin with cool touches like this build plate on the dash here, embossed headrests, racy red seat belts, and even plain nice materials like this gear shifter, suede steering wheel, and metallic door handle. These seats are much more bucketed than the Corollas. I've got a nice base to sit on, and there's good support around my thighs and around my sides as well. You've got good adjustability in the steering wheel to get that right driving position, and there's just generally more space for your knees and to get comfortable inside the cabin. You've also got much more storage around the center console with a bin, dual deep cup holders, and a sizable tray underneath the dash with integrated wireless charger. Now elsewhere, you've got a digital instrument cluster and a 9-inch infotainment screen, which beats the Corollas in terms of size. Now there's also a lot more to it in functionality, so we'll get to that in just a moment. The 9-inch infotainment screen is easy to use thanks to prominent shortcuts both on the screen and beside it. There's wireless Apple CarPlay and wired Android Auto for you to use, or you can make do with the system's own functionality with things like digital radio and native satellite navigation. Embedded within the system is Honda's cool Log R Track Data Recorder function that can convey information about your driving performance on a closed road. It'll connect to a phone app so that drivers can monitor their own performance after the fact, which is a cool add-on for such a performance-focused car. The digital cluster in front of the driver is configurable in myriad ways to show all kinds of car data and recordings. Put the car in full R Plus mode and the display changes again for an all-enveloping performance screen best suited to a single-focus track experience. In the second row, behind my own driving position, there's a ton more legroom, though my headroom is decidedly more constrained with that sloping roofline. Now, if you'll believe me, there's even less going on in the second row here in terms of amenity. There are no power ports, no map pockets, and it's even missing a third seat on the bench here. This wing not only is handy for aerodynamics, but it also doubles as a boot opener. Now that paves way to a 410 litre boot capacity, and you've got a slide across cargo blind to keep your items away from prying eyes. Underneath the boot floor, you've got a tyre repair kit, just like the Corolla, but that's enough about interiors, details, that sort of thing. Let's get into the actual drive. We've selected some of the best driving roads east of Melbourne so that we can figure out which one of these cars fares better on the bitumen. Well, the Corolla is known for being comfortable, economical, and quite frankly, boring but this is no ordinary Toyota Corolla. With 221 kilowatts and 370 newton meters routed through all four wheels, this car is an absolute firecracker and it feels like it when you're pedaling up these steep mountain hills like we are at the moment. The engine certainly feels like it does its best work down low in the rev range and as you get higher, it sort of tapers off a little bit, but that's actually no real slight on the Corolla. It is very fast for what we know a Toyota Corolla to be. Now, one thing I particularly love is this gear shift. It is very notchy and precise. And in isolation, it feels really, really good. The GR Corolla has a curb weight of 1,485 kilograms. And although that's a little bit porkier than the Civic Type R, it does have two extra driven wheels. But overall, it does certainly feel quite leaf and nimble around corners. Again, with that six-speed manual transmission, it comes with an intelligent rev matching function for when you're downshifting. It'll automatically blip the throttle and give you the right amount of revs to set you off again. Now, the steering feel inside this GR Corolla, it's actually a bit of a heavy weight to it, and as you feed it through the bends, there's certainly a bit of heft there, but it doesn't offer all too much feedback through from the Yokohama Advan Apex tires. Another thing which I'm quite enjoying in this GR Corolla is it certainly feels planted and extremely focused through bends, but you don't pay the price for it around town. It certainly has a soft edge ride quality to it, 
However, you do have a fair bit of road noise to contend with when you are on B roads and on freeways alike. It sort of just comes through into the cabin and fills the space all encompassing, it's not that nice. While we're on the subject, the noise from that 1.6 litre three cylinder engine is pretty epic and certainly feels a little bit louder than the Type R. So if you all want to enjoy a little bit of exhaust noise out the back, this is certainly the better pick. Overall, the GR Corolla certainly feels like it holds its own around these tight and twisty roads and you don't really pay the price for it either when you're around town. But let's go see how the Civic Type R fares in this terrain before heading to the track. It doesn't take long being sat inside this Civic Type R to feel like it's a more connected car overall. There are a few more vibrations coming through to the cabin, a few more mechanical noises, and in that vein, it sort of feels like a little bit like a Porsche GT3. Just a little bit more connected, and overall, you enjoy the feeling. This steering weight is a little bit lighter in terms of its feel compared to the GR Corolla, but it is so direct, it is so pointed, and it feels so much more agile all for it. In isolation, the GR Corolla's six-speed manual transmission felt nice and notchy, but in this car, it just feels so much better. And the fact that you've got that really lovely metallic gear knob, it just feels great. With more power and fewer driven wheels, you might think that the Civic Type R is a bit more of a handful compared to the GR Corolla and its all-wheel drive system. But that's simply not the case. Between the limited slip differential and the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires, which measure 265 all round, by the way, there is a stronghold of grip and you have a high degree of confidence coming into a bend, applying power midway through, and then shooting out the other side. Much like the GR Corolla, this Civic Type R gets its own driving modes, which you can cycle through down here on the center console, but it ends up in an ultimate R mode, which if you press it like I am now, a specific graphic shows up in the instrument cluster and everything gets turned up to 11. The suspension tune inside the Civic Type R is decidedly firm when compared to the GR Corolla. And on these roads we're driving right now, it feels very jumpy and bumpy, but overall it feels very connected to the road and you don't have that much of a worry with driving through the corners and body roll and that sort of thing. While you do certainly feel like you're connected to the road out here, it really can annoy when you're around town. The Civic Type R doesn't have as much going for it in terms of noise. When you put it into that Ultima R mode, there is a little bit more noise coming through to the cabin, but it's certainly not as shouty as the GR Corolla. Now for me, today, overall, I think it's a Civic Type R, which just feels a little bit more connected and you're really not paying the price for it when you're driving around town. It's comfortable, compliant, you have more room around the cabin. It's just a nicer car overall, but let's see if it's backed up tomorrow at the track. Okay, it's racetrack time and we've got a hardcore Honda and a Toyota Tornado. We are at the Haunted Hills circuit, 1.4 kilometers, 16 turns, crazy elevation changes as you can see. Which one of these two is going to be quicker? And equally, which one is going to be more fun? Now you'd be forgiven for assuming that the Honda will be quicker because Honda's made a lot of noise about its Nürburgring lap time. Toyota, however, hasn't. So in order to find out which one of these two is the track legend, we've come to the same racetrack on the same day with the same driver and we'll put them against the clock. We've booked this track out with our own dime. Now that should be worth a like for this video and maybe a subscribe too while you're at it. Okay, we're on track in the Toyota GR Corolla. Let's have a couple of slow laps while we have a look at what this car's got in here to help us go fast and to help us when we are going fast. First off, we've got some pretty firm sports bucket seats, manually adjustable. We've also got a manually adjustable steering wheel, which is giving me a pretty good combination driving position. Well, I do feel like I'm sitting a bit higher than I was expecting. What else, what else, what else? Well, why don't we get to the oily bits? Obviously, we've got the 1.6 litre three-cylinder turbo petrol engine. We've got, and I love it, an old-school six-speed manual transmission. And underneath, we've got Toyota's GR4 all-wheel drive with two limited slip diffs, one up the front, one down the back. Now, there's a bit of trickery in this all-wheel drive system. It actually has a function that lets you choose how much torque split you want front to rear. In everyday driving, it's 60% front, 40% rear. 
makes for a very benign, easy daily driver. When you get onto a racetrack or when you perhaps get to a more enthusiastic road, you can adjust that. You can have 30% front, 70% rear, which gives you a really strong rear bias. Or in track mode, when you set it, 50-50 front rear, which I'm assuming will give us the best lap times around here. Interestingly, compared to the Honda, one thing we don't have in here is a multi-mode or adjustable dampers. So one suspension tune has to do both on-road compliant and racetrack firm. We'll see just how effective they are when we turn up the wick. Oh, and I forgot to mention IMT. I think it means intelligent manual transmission, but it's basically a rev matching function switchable, which I kind of like. I like having a go at trying to do a bit of heel toe, matching the revs myself. But if you're feeling lazy or in a few minutes time when I'm focused on trying to get the best lap time I can, I'll give it over to the car and let it do the job for me. So that's kind of cool that you have that choice. All right, enough of the preamble. I think the car's warmed up. I think I've reminded myself which way the track goes. Let's hit it. All right, I'm not doing a standing start each time. It's too hard. Instead, I'll roll across the start line at 50 kilometers an hour in second and boot it. Drop it back to 50 kilometers an hour and we go. Tuck in, tuck in. Oh, nice bit of rear end steer there. Bit wide, bit wide, come on. Some of these corners take a long time. All right. And across the finish line. Whew. Okay, first impressions. Holy hell, this thing is a lot of fun. Oh boy, it feels like a terrier, like a bulldog. It's just so eager. So much grip too, but when you get to the limits of the grip, it just sort of gives way and then it really it's up to you to bring it back under control front end feels pretty good i can definitely feel where the limits of the front end's grip are and you could see i can definitely feel what the rear end is doing a couple of times there i had to kind of open the lock let everything straighten up but i think this thing's trick coming out of corners is you can just punch it really let it do its thing oh. Just quietly, I'm kind of glad that this is really just a second and third gear track because as much as I like this transmission on the road, there's a, there's a resistance or a clunkiness to it that doesn't make it as easy as I'd like around this racetrack when you're really in the heat of battle. Same for the seats. I'm feeling like they could do with a bit more bolstering because this car has the grip to really, really throw you around. If this is what I spent 64,000 or close to 70,000 on road, I'd be pretty happy with what it can do around here. It does, it does have its limitations. I'd like a bit more body control. It does roll a fair bit and I think that compromises the ability to kind of get the power down because change of direction, which is so crucial around this track, it just doesn't settle fast enough. Uh, but I guess we'll see if the Honda's any better in that regard. Certainly got a longer wheelbase, the Honda. Longer overall, lower centre of gravity because it's got a lower roof. And it's lighter. So it should. But I reckon the times this car set would be pretty quick. So Honda's going to have to be pretty good to beat those times. And now we're into the Honda Civic Type R. What have we got in here? Well, let's start with these 
sports bucket seats, very buckety, very deep, very strong bolstering, which straight away I reckon is going to be a bit of an advantage over the Toyota. And of course they're red, with a red seatbelt, which as we know is faster, right? Red is the fastest colour. Both the seats and the steering wheel are manually adjustable, so same as the Corolla. Uh, but again, straight away, I can feel I am sitting a little bit lower in this car. So I reckon that'll just help with the driver perception. Now, up the front, doing all the work for me, I've got a two-litre turbocharged four-cylinder engine, 235 kilowatts, 420 newton metres. So that's a, what is that, 14 kilowatts and 50 newton metre advantage over the Corolla. Could be interesting front limited slip diff because this is only front wheel drive so that could be interesting the Corolla's all wheel drive definitely gave it some punch out of corners what else what else are ah, the business end of things the R plus button drive modes we have three drive modes sport normal and individual we also have plus R which does a whole bunch of things first of all sharpens the throttle secondly adds some nice weight to the steering wheel. Gives it a real, not heaviness, but a real substance to it, which I really liked on the road, and I have a feeling I'll really like it around here. At least I hope I do. It also helps with the multi-mode dampers. We do have adjustable dampers here, so you can have more compliance on the road, and you can wick it up so that you've got a much more stable and firm base for attacking a racetrack. Now, where the Toyota had IMT, you remember I was talking about that? Intelligent manual transmission, or at least that's what I'm going with. Basically rev matching. The Honda does rev matching as well, but so far I haven't found a way to switch it off. On the road, I thought that would annoy me, but it kind of didn't, because when I decided to do a bit of heel and toe, it didn't confuse things. Well, if I'm being totally honest, I don't know if I flummoxed it and the car fixed it and made me think I was a hero, or whether I got it right and the car didn't feel it need to do anything. Either way, the electrics controlling that little system work really well. All right, same procedure as last time. I've got the car in plus R mode, which should give us everything that it's got to give. We'll cross the start finish line in second gear, 50 kilometers an hour and then we'll boot it. Whoa, straight away. I gotta be more careful on the throttle. Oh, she's lively. lot more work than I was expecting. A lot more violent too. The suspension doesn't really like uh, the raised ripple strips around here. Gets the car all kind of wound up and when you're trying to put on the power this makes for a very very busy office. But this engine is beautiful. My well, Honda's done fantastic engines for a long time. Performance engines that is and this one is definitely one of the nicer ones that I've driven. It's got a lot to give. Doesn't seem to have a weakness either in its oh, in its rev band. The Toyota to me when it was starting to get up into the higher revs felt not breathless but it felt like it had gone past its torque peak and it was kind of just buttoning off a little. This thing revs much harder right up to rev line but boy you've really got to manage the front end, front end grip. The fact that this car's two-wheel drive, front-wheel drive compared to all-wheel drive means you've got to drive it differently. 
Luckily, it's a very talkative front end. You can really feel how much grip you've got. You can feel how hard the steering is working. I felt like I was starting to get in tune. This car has got more, it requires more precision, a bit more surgical approach to the steering, definitely to the throttle. This is probably the hardest area of this car to manage is the throttle. Around here, the corners are so tight, the elevation changes come at you so quickly. There's a lot of weight shift going on and you need to be really aware of that to get the best out of this car. Okay, so we've come to the end of our road and track test, but before we decide on a winner, Tom has not told me the lap times that I've done. No, we've kept it a secret. But first, before we get into that, what do you think felt like the better car out there on the track? That is a really good question because they both, they go about their craft in very different ways. This Toyota felt brutally quick. The Honda felt a bit more like a scalpel, you know, very sharp, very honed. If I had to guess, I would guess the Honda, but pretty close, I reckon. Well, I can tell you that your best time in the Corolla GR was one minute and three seconds, 0.24. Ooh, okay. So pretty, pretty quick, but the Civic Type R best time was one minute and three seconds, 0.18. You're kidding? Yep. Six one hundredths of a second. Yeah, there was not a lot in it at all. Holy hell. Okay, well, I don't know if I had much more to give these cars. I was pushing them as far as I was comfortable, knowing that neither of them are mine. So if I came to a track day and I owned the car, maybe I could get more out of it. And you know, I feel like the longer I spend with the Honda, the more I could improve there. But I feel with the Toyota, it's just a bit more rough around the edges. The harder I push it, I think the more ragged I would get. Exactly, and it felt like that on the road as well. This certainly felt like the sharper car. <laughs> no disrespect to Toyota whatsoever. That's a fantastic car in its own right, but given what, we've got $70,000 plus or minus $3,000 to play with, I think I'm going home with the Civic Type R. I would too, that's my car. But it's not because this car is bad. It's got such appeal. It's just that they're two very different cars. I guess that one's your baseball bat bludgeoning the hell out of the racetrack. That's your samurai sword. And I think they will appeal to do different kinds of buyers too. So no loser really. I mean, hot hatches, Not at all. they're pretty cool right now. No, yeah? Both of these two, like we said in the introduction, these are two, some of the best hot hatches you can buy. So yeah, whether you're going home with a Toyota or the Civic, Civic Type I, you are in really good stead. Exactly. So I hope you've enjoyed this. We've certainly had a lot of fun making this. It's not every day the office is a racetrack. If you've liked this video, please give us a like. If you have some comments to share, or you want to tell us which one of these two you prefer, get into the comments there and let's have a conversation. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Drive's YouTube channel and hit that notification bell so that when Drive drives cool cars like these, you hear about it first. While we're comparing these two hot hatches today, what about the Hyundai i30N, I hear you ask? Well, we've compared that against the Type R as well, so click the link on screen to find out how that comparison went down.